And just like that, we've arrived at the month of celebrations. <laughs> December is packed full of holidays, traditions, feasts, festivities. And this year, we're coming into these celebrations after a month of addressing difficult <coughs> subjects in worship services. I realize at this point, for those of you who have hung in there over the course of these sermons, some of you might be wondering if I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even, what's wrong with that kid? But I hope that you know by now how much I value truth. You can always count on me to give it to you straight. I believe strongly that dealing with difficult subjects is necessary and important because to pretend that things are okay when they are not is to lie. And I respect you and the office of minister too much to lie to you, even if it is lying by omission. Of course, truth is not all that I value in ministry. And it is time now for us to turn the corner into a month of celebration. And I can think of no better transition from difficulty to celebration than exploring joy as a means of resistance to all of the horrible things that we talked about last month. Joy as a means of pushing back the darkness. Joy as the holy no to oppression, to sorrow. And so I thought I'd do that by talking about Nazis. <laughs> before was a German minister who was a vocal opponent of the Nazi party. Adolf Hitler wanted control of the German church, and most of these churches were fine with that because they wanted national unity and they wanted strong ties with the government. The German churches were lured into collaboration with the Nazi government, governments by a short-sighted power grab. And this effort was resisted by a handful of theologians, including Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And they founded a resistance denomination that was called the German Confessing Church, as in they confessed there was a power greater than Adolf Hitler. You can imagine how well that went over. During Hitler's rise to power, Bonhoeffer made a few trips to the United States to try to raise awareness about what was actually happening in Germany. And there was a concerted effort by American theologians to get Bonhoeffer to defect, but he never did. He felt it was his duty to return to Germany and to continue to resist the Nazi regime. His work was focused on young adults, educating them about true Christianity and encouraging them to resist Nazism. He also ran an underground seminary and managed to train 70 ministers by the time that he was arrested in April of 1943. While he was imprisoned at the Flossenburg concentration camp, Bonhoeffer continued to minister and write. He even wrote on toilet paper at times. Those writings demonstrate that through everything, Bonhoeffer relied ever more strongly on joy as a source of strength, courage, and resistance. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a martyr. He was executed on April 9th of 1945. But his legacy lives on. He lives on. When we tell his story and when we remember what he taught about joy as a tool of resistance. Every December, we are bombarded by messages telling us to find joy. 
and to look for it in shopping malls. <laughs> or whatever the latest electronic doodad might be. Or in ill-fitting belief systems. Now, folks, I think we all know that is not joy. It might be a fleeting type of happiness, I guess, but it's not joy. Joy is not found in things, nor is it found in flimsy theology. The joy that Bonhoeffer knew was tough, resilient, life-saving. In his words, the joy of God has gone through the poverty of the manger and the agony of the cross. It's time of year to talk a lot about the Christmas story and its tidings of comfort and joy. But what does that mean? If we're to understand that comfort and joy come from the Christmas story, we have to look at that story with a critical eye. I promise you, it is not about shepherds and wise men and angels and animals laying in the dirt. It's easy to forget that the baby Jesus grows up to be the man Jesus, the man who was a wandering vindicant, preaching a vision of love so radical that it included the most marginalized people, a love so powerful that it could overthrow the Roman Empire and end all oppression. The joy that Bonhoeffer spoke of, the joy that is truly at the heart of the real Christmas story, has known deep suffering. When joy and suffering become estranged, joy is replaced with a cheap imposter that leaves us hollow in any month. But especially during December when we crave and we need so much more. I find that hollow, knockoff version of joy so offensive. It is a cotton candy sentiment that has no foundation, no grit, and no truth. Joy, <clears throat> real joy, is the antidote to a life of numbness. I think that we are all familiar with the voice that speaks to us when things get hard and tells us that resignation is easy. And maybe it is. But at what cost? We can either let that numbness, that melancholy, that resignation that Bonhoeffer and the early church called acedia, we can let that take us or we can resist. Bonhoeffer resisted more than Nazis. He resisted the resignation that gripped the hearts of his fellow Germans, that resignation that allowed them to slip from it's none of my business to what could I do to Nazi sympathizer. Bonhoeffer called people out of that numbness through and with joy. As he wrote to his colleagues, how are we going to be able to help those who have become joyless and discouraged if we ourselves are not borne along by courage and joy? The joy that Bonhoeffer knew was nothing like that meaningless joy that comes cheap and covered in tinsel every December. Joy for Bonhoeffer was a lifeline. Now folks, this type of joy is not something that just happens. It is not a fleeting emotion that we may or may not have. The joy that Bonhoeffer knew was a fierce joy, a hard-won joy, something that had to be cultivated and cared for. His joy was a spiritual practice required attention and conscious effort. 
It was an unremarkable daily effort to love life in full awareness of its tough realities. This joy is a conscious effort to resist despair and numbness rather than turn away and pretend that hard things don't exist. I almost feel like the joy that Diedrich Bonhoeffer wrote about needs a different name to distinguish it from the meaningless use of the word in American culture. <clears throat> I, I often search for images related to keywords and sermons. When I searched for the word joy, I found a bunch of pictures of children and people in their 20s jumping up against clear blue skies like this. <laughs> <laughs> There is even a picture of a fluffy dog. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> Everything about that just makes my skin crawl. It reduces joy from a lifeline of support for the oppressed and the hurting into something insipid and meaningless. Real joy is rooted in reality and it is fertilized by hardship. Joy is the holy no that our soul speaks to life-denying forces. Joy is how we resist the numbness that so gently and easily drags us from our good intentions into collusion with those life-denying forces. Joy is what keeps our head above water, and it is the life preserver that we pass to others who are in the struggle with us. To speak of joy in such times as these seems dissonant. Many of us are afraid, anxious, <coughs> angry, but not to speak of joy not to take time to experience joy, it feels worse to me. To omit talk of joy in troubled times is to preemptively let trouble win. If we are to liberate joy from the shallow grave of sentimentality, we must come to understand it as an act of resistance. When destructive forces seek to take away our happiness, our security, our joy, we must say the holy no. No, you may not take this away from me. The world is changing, times are hard, I am afraid. But no, no, you will not have my joy. And of course, one of the most beautiful and tangible expressions of joy as the holy no that resists oppression and will not let trouble win is music, especially folk music traditions. The hymns that we chose today are examples of oppressed people using joy to bring them through pain. Not pretending that suffering doesn't exist, but looking it straight in the eye and saying, no, suffering, no, you don't get to win. Our opening hymn, and remember back that far, <laughs> was Siahamba. Siahamba evolved out of the Zulu folk tradition of South Africa. It has been popular in American Protestant churches since the 1990s. It is closely associated with Nelson Mandela, and it was sung at his funeral and at churches around the world the Sunday after he died. But it is most widely and most appropriately known as the rally song of the anti-apartheid movement. South African apartheid was brutal. It ended in 1994, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was founded to help heal the nation. That commission uncovered human rights violations against approximately 22,000 people. And when a report of those crimes was ready, there was a public ceremony. The head
head of the commission, who happened to be Archbishop Desmond Tutu, handed a copy of the report to President Nelson Mandela, while the choir sang Siahama in the background. And those two men, two of the most dignified men that I can think of, spontaneously danced. <laughs> they who had witnessed and endured violence at the hands of the state, danced. They didn't dance because it was over, it was actually just beginning. They danced because they had been borne along by joy, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And the same thing is true of our closing hymn that's coming up, which is an African-American spiritual we're going to close the service today with peace like a river. And one of the verses is, I've got joy like a fountain. To think of joy like a fountain as part of the experience of American chattel slavery is almost incomprehensible. Joy wasn't because the authors were particularly happy. This joy like a fountain, had been nurtured in the midst of and in defiance of pain and suffering. To paraphrase Bonhoeffer's letter, it was joy precisely in the middle of that pain. Joy not because it was convenient, but because it was necessary. Not because it was easy, but because it was hard. Joy as a means of resistance to oppression, subversive, life-giving joy, the holy no that upheld and sustained American slaves, South African freedom fighters, and Nazi resistors, and us in an hour of turmoil when we are called to resist our own despair, melancholy, or numbness. Pretty soon, we're going to sing Peace Like a River. And my challenge to you, dear ones, is to sing it with some joy. <laughs> <laughs> Congregations like ours, that are predominantly white, have for decades been famously and correctly skewered for singing every hymn as if we are completely miserable. <laughs> As the comedian Eddie Azark once pointed out, I have been ages past. <laughs> Let us try to honor the memory of the people who wrote the spiritual by singing it with some joy. Maybe some smiling. <laughs> Maybe some clapping on the two and the four. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even a little bit of movement. <laughs> Knowing the tough realities of the world or of our past does not erase our joy. Our joy is what allows us to deal honestly with pain and to still fiercely love this world. The joy that holds us together as an individual when we are suffering, and the joy that holds us to one another as a community of people who all know what it is to suffer. The true joy that knows the poverty of the manger and the agony of the cross, but goes on loving life fearlessly, endlessly, even unto death. The joy that is fierce and worth fighting for because we are fierce and worth fighting for. Maybe so. <laughs>